Yes, I can hear you. Sorry for the delay. Uh, uh, obviously, the problem is removed. You can start your talk. Uh, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you all for uh, uh, having me here uh, this morning, your time, my evening time. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to meet everyone. Uh, the origin of this presentation really began with wound care. Not as much with hyperbaric oxygen medicine. Uh, during the pandemic, when it first started, we were very concerned that the wound care patients would not come into the hospital because they were afraid of contracting the virus. As a result of that, uh, we made a big push to say that wound care was an essential service, that, that uh, the patients uh, should come in uh, uh, to the centers. And uh, we have about 30 centers in the United States. And uh, fortunately, throughout the pandemic, uh, we were able to keep all of the wound care centers open, in, open and seeing patients. And it was this that really began uh, the, what I'm going to talk to you about th this morning, which is the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, for, uh, in COVID-19 disease. Now, for those of you who may not know hyperbaric, uh, what it is uh, is a chamber filled with uh, oxygen, 100% oxygen, and that pressurizes the chamber to about uh, 2.4 to 2.5 times that of uh, atmospheric pressure. The increased pressure forces a large amount of oxygen into uh, the circulation, and the, the PaO2 is well over 2,000. So it's a tremendous amount of oxygen and has several effects that uh, may be beneficial in the treatment of uh, COVID-19. Our initial thought was that it would just increase oxygenation, but it turns out to be much more than that. And I'm gonna share with you now our first patient, and uh, this is the index case. She was a 47-year-old African-American woman, and she was an employee of the hospital, uh, and a very uh, beloved employee. She had been there for many, many years, and everyone in the hospital knew her. Uh, now, this is at uh, one of our smaller research hospitals, uh, called Opelousas General in Opelousas, Louisiana, in the United States. So she was admitted to the hospital. Uh, her saturations were decreasing. She was placed into the ICU, and uh, the uh, pulmonologist uh, uh, called uh, uh, us, actually called Dr. Thibodeau, who's the principal investigator there, and said that he was going to have to intubate her. And he feared that once she was placed on mechanical ventilation, that uh, she would she would die. The mortality at that point for patients who were intubated and placed on mechanical ventilation was somewhere in the range of 65 to 70 percent. She had a number of comorbidities such as high blood pressure, obesity, sleep and sleep apnea. She was admitted uh, early on in the pandemic and on April 8th of 2020. And when we first met her. Uh, when she was brought to the hyperbaric unit from the ICU, she was breathing 50 breaths a minute, just a tremendous amount of breathing. And it was very clear that if uh, we didn't do something, that uh, she was going to be intubated very, very soon. So uh, she had been uh, prior to that treated with vapor therm, which is a high flow oxygen at 100 percent. But despite that, her saturations were still falling uh, precipitously. Her D-dimers and CRP were elevated, as so often happens in COVID-19. We uh, put her into the hyperbaric chamber at two atmospheres at 100% oxygen. And during the middle of the treatment, uh, uh, she, was, she wasn't responsive. And Marcus uh, Sprayer, who was, the, who was the tech and manager there, was, became very concerned. He picked up the phone that's attached to the hyperbaric, and he, he was you know, trying to get her to wake up. And she woke up and she was very mad at us because she hadn't slept in two days because she was breathing so hard. And now she had finally gotten some sleep and we had interrupted her. She would get five hyperbaric treatments daily for the next five days. And her D-dimers fell to uh, uh, 1,600 and her CRP uh, fell to 8.3 within, uh, within that short time frame. She would go home uh, in uh, roughly 10 days after she was treated with hyperbaric and she was never intubated. 
Now, this was the first case, and it was only one case, but it really started us to think about perhaps uh, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy might be a treatment to prevent mechanical ventilation in these patients with severe COVID-19. So I think this is a disease we all know. Two to 14 days after exposure, patients get a fever, I get a, a terrible cough. A lot of our patients have a terrible cough. Uh, they get shortness of breath and have difficulty breathing. Uh, and then there's a number of other uh, symptoms such as loss of taste and smell. And I think everybody now pretty much is aware of the symptoms that occur. The risk factors, uh, uh, male gender, hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, obesity, sleep apnea. The patient that we first treated, she certainly had a, a large number uh, of uh, comorbidities that put her at high risk. Uh, and then age over 65. The idea based on this first case was that uh, COVID-19 patients in the ICU with falling oxygen saturation, even though we're increasing their uh, oxygen delivery, their FiO2, they have, they have blood clotting difficulties with elevated deep dimers, and once they're intubated, the mortality rises very sharply. So when we first did this, there really weren't a lot of clinical trials that were available. Remdesivir, dexamethasone were, were available. Of course, now we have additional uh, therapies uh, and hopefully soon vaccines. Uh, but there were a lot of clinical trials ongoing. Uh, and what we thought was what we needed in this time at that time was you know, a therapy that was already approved by the US FDA and had a safety record. And, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy is very safe. The complication rate for hyperbaric is, uh, is uh, uh, serious complications are one in 10,000 treatments. It's, they're very, very rare. I mean, some patients have some ear difficulties, but for the most part, uh, it, that's uh, about the, the, the extent of it. When we looked at the uh, potential therapies, there were a lot of potential therapies, but the problem was uh, they had a lot of potential side effects. And again, this is pre-vaccine, and we were uh, we were looking for a therapy uh, that we could institute that really didn't have a lot of side effects in patients that already had large amounts of comorbidities, and in addition, uh, patients that were that were critically ill. And that's what brought us to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Although I have to be honest with you, it, it really wasn't our idea. It was the it was the pulmonologist who thought of it. And uh, he was really looking for anything that he could do to try to save this patient. And uh, he, it was his idea. And uh, we gave him credit in the paper that was eventually published. What you see on this screen is, uh, is the two types of oxygen uh, uh, chambers that we have. On the top is one of our multi-place chambers in which we can sit 12 people at one time and you pressurize it with air and the patients breathe oxygen. On the lower half, you see there's two monoplace chambers and just one person is admitted to the chamber that's filled with 100% oxygen. Uh, and that's the, we use oxygen to pressurize those chambers uh, and the patients will stay there for about two hours in total in both the multi-place and the monoplace. We did a literature search to, to see why would hyperbaric oxygen therapy work uh, in patients with COVID-19? Well, the first and obvious reason was that we were going to deliver an enormous amount of oxygen. And uh, we thought initially that the primary effect may be to simply reverse the hypoxia. Uh, and that's somewhat true, but that's not really uh, what made this a viable therapy. Uh, we also uh, thought that it would reduce pulmonary inflammation, which is true. And it, in addition, it reduces uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly interleukin-6. And they were already, uh, I mean, drug trials were already undergoing that were targeting interleukin-6, but we knew that hyperbaric oxygen therapy reduced pulmonary uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. That, was, that had been studied by Steve Thom, um, you know, uh, over the last decade. In addition, uh, high, uh, radical oxygen species, which are produced uh, by high-dose oxygen, increase uh, virucidal uh, uh, or virucidal. Uh, also, there's an upregulation in hypoxic inducible factor, which increases host defense peptides, such as uh, defensin and, cath and the catholicidins 
So all of these put together, it seemed to make sense. There was a mechanism of action that might explain why a patient treated uh, with uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, uh, when they have severe COVID-19, uh, it may be beneficial. So there's an unpublished report from China uh, that we, we found uh, as we were getting started. And they had treated five patients in Wuhan for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, they uh, all the patients were positive. They ranged in age from 24 to 69 years. CT scans revealed uh, uh, their pulmonary ch imaging changes consistent with COVID-19. And uh, what they found was that uh, uh, patients initially were treated two atmospheres, and then they dropped the oxygen dose. We didn't do that. We treated all of our patients with two atmospheres every time. So we had this anecdotal re report. At that time, it wasn't published. In fact, I'm not sure it's still published. Interesting enough, in their series, uh, fever was not a persistent sy symptoms. They treated five patients. The main complaint for them was shortness of breath, just like our patients. And the shortness of breath seemed to resolve early on after the early treatments with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And later on, I will tell you that's exactly what we saw as well. And remember in our first patient, she went into the chamber. She was breathing 50 breaths a minute at that point. And shortly thereafter, after coming out of the chamber, when we opened up the chamber, we pulled her out, uh, her, her, her breathing rate had, had fallen from 50 to 30. And she, uh, after a couple of hyperbaric treatments, would go to normal. D-dimers and fiber inhibitions also decreased after HBO in, um, uh, in the Chinese study. And our, our patient, our first patient, they did as well. That hasn't stayed true in all the patients we've treated since then. Uh, but there are certain groups of patients in which the D-dimers will fall. So uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Thibodeau there leaning up against the chamber. And this is the hyperbaric chamber uh, in Opelousas uh, General Health System in uh, Opelousas, Louisiana. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a center where we're doing a lot of active uh, research. They have six hyperbaric uh, oxygen uh, chambers. So let me go through the first cases. Uh, we have a large number of cases now. But these are the first ones uh, all treated in April of this year. The next patient was another um, uh, employee, 64-year-old African-American women. And we know that African-Americans also were at increased risk for having complications related to COVID-19. She was a diabetic, had hypertension, obesity, uh, lupus, and hypothyroidism, a lot of comorbidities. Uh, she had similar uh, tachypnea, breathing 40 breaths per minute. And despite being on high flow oxygen, she was uh, uh, still having falling saturations. Uh, she would receive three hyperbaric treatments, again, at two atmospheres uh, for 90 minutes each treatment. And that was that's now our standard. That's what we use uh, in, in this patient group. And uh, she would only require uh, three treatments before she became asymptomatic. She also uh, never required mechanical ventilation and was discharged to home uh, by the 23rd of April. Our next patient was a male patient with diabetes and hypertension. Uh, was admitted again in mid-April of 2020. Same scenario, and all these patients are going to be very similar in that they have tachypnea. They're breathing very heavily. The pulmonologist and hospitalist very concerned that shortly thereafter, they're going to have to intubate these patients with a high mortality rate associated with mechanical ventilation. Uh, his D-dimers fell, uh, as uh, it did for the first two patients, uh, but he would require nine treatments. And this is not uncommon. The average number of treatments that we, we now have in, um, in, in over 50 patients that we've treated is roughly about five. And it ranges from one to 10. And how do we decide uh, how many treatments to give the patients? Well, I don't have a lot of science here. We basically uh, base it on how they're improving. If they seem to be getting better clinically, if their if if their breathing rate is fallen, uh, if they require less oxygen therapy, uh, then uh, then we will uh, uh, we'll stop HBO. So it's really a clinical judgment call, and we'd get together with the intensive care unit group and the pulmonologists, and uh, they, you make a decision as to how many treatments the patient is going to require. The other thing is that one thing you've noticed here is that. These first five patients that we treated, in actuality, uh, we, we treated them uh, when they were just about ready to be intubated. It was early on. 
And we were worried that these patients were going to uh, be intubated and have a high rate of mortality. I will tell you now that as we've gone on and we've treated a lot more patients, and I think in our registry now, we're coming up near 100 uh, patients. Uh, what, we've, what we're now doing is treating them a little bit earlier. When we see that they're taking a, you know, a downward trend, when we see that it looks like they're going to reach this point of, uh, of high, do high flow oxygen and breathing very rapidly, uh, and, yet, and their saturations are falling, uh, we're, we're not letting them get to that point. In fact, one of the failures that we've had was that we had a patient who's unfortunately a doctor, uh, one of the hospitalists at one of the hospitals. And uh, by the time we treated him, he was breathing over 40 breaths a minute and his saturation uh, was 89% on 100% high flow. And we gave him three HBO treatments in a row, but after the third one, he did require mechanical ventilation. So he was one of the patients uh, in our registry that uh, did not, uh, that, it, that we couldn't prevent mechanical ventilation. Now, in these first five patients, not a single patient was intubated. So let me go on and uh, fill out the, uh, the first five, and then we'll go on and talk about some of the other uh, cases that we've had. Our next patient was also an African-American woman, 42 years of age. Uh, she was obese, uh, and uh, she was uh, initially in the COVID isolation unit. And as you can see here, we're starting to learn that if we treat these patients earlier and don't let them get to the point where they've got a tremendous breathing rate, that, uh, uh, we ha that we, it requires less hyperbaric. And this is a great case for that because she was not in the ICU yet. But the intensivists had already identified her. They'd already said, look, this is, this is going to be a patient that is going to have problems. So she was on uh, uh, O2 at four liters a, uh, per a minute, uh, and they were increasing that. Uh, we gave her one hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, therapy, two atmospheres again for about an hour and a half, 90 minutes, and that's all she required. And she, uh, she was discharged uh, uh, not too long after that. So you can see the trend already on case number four, earlier intervention, not letting them get to the point where the next option, if hyperbaric doesn't work, is intubation. So it's just a little bit earlier. We're not treating every patient with COVID with hyperbaric. I don't, don't get me wrong. These are patients that clearly are heading toward uh, mechanical ventilation. Those are the patients in which hyperbaric seems to have the greatest effect and the greatest role uh, in the way we're treating patients uh, today here in the U.S. Case number five of our first case series, a 38-year-old woman uh, with hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. She also was in the COVID isolation unit, and uh, we, we picked her up early on. The minute she uh, was uh, uh, admitted through the emergency room, uh, the actually the emergency room doctor uh, called Dr. Thibodeau and said, I, I think this is a patient that's going to need hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So we actually knew about her before she ever got to the COVID isolation unit. She was breathing uh, heavily at 40 uh, breaths per minute. Her uh, oxygen saturations were trending in the wrong direction. And uh, she, we treated her with three HBO treatments uh, and she actually was discharged after the third treatment. And you can make a case that she didn't even need the third one, but it's kind of hard to know when to stop. I have to be very honest and even even the, our personal experience now with dozens and dozens of patients, it's still hard to say, is it three treatments? Is it five? We're, we're still learning. And to be honest, the patients have different severities of diseases, uh, at, of COVID disease. And it's it can be difficult to tell exactly how many treatments the patient is going to require. So these are our first five patients who were treated in April 2020. And uh, uh, we... Whoops. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is uh, a narrative playing of this one, so I'm going to skip through this. And uh, but well, after the first um, after the first five patients, uh, we were able to publish it. It was funny because we didn't actually know that no one had public had published the use of hyperbaric in COVID-19. Uh, we were just doing it to try to help patients out in the middle of this uh, crisis, this pandemic, and so. Uh, 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 we published it and it ended up being the first English language publication on the use of HBOT uh, for hyperbaric. Uh, this, uh, uh, this portion or this slide is was given to me by Marcus Sprayer. Marcus is uh, one of our nurses and is really to be highly credited for making this happen. And in fact, uh, he, this, he probably deserves most of the credit. 
uh, one of the real challenges is that you know the hyperbaric unit is not in the ICU. Uh, the hyperbaric unit is, uh, now, fortunately, in Opelousas, the hyperbaric unit is next to the ICU. It's fairly close. You you make a little S uh, in the hallway and you're and you're there. So uh, Marcus came up with a system on how to get the patients from the intensive care unit to the hyperbaric unit. And that sounds simple when I say it. And I hear myself say it and I say, yeah, that sounds like it's not that difficult. But it, it was probably the biggest challenge we had. What we did or what Marcus came up with was uh, we would send uh, the nurses to the ICU and the nurses would get the patients completely ready for hyperbaric in the ICU, in the intensive care unit. Uh, so they're all ready to go. We then, uh, we then uh, placed a mask on them and a, and a shield. Uh, and we had, uh, and we developed a negative pressure system in the hyperbaric unit where we were uh, filtering the air out. Uh, we made sure that uh, uh, there was nobody in the, no patients or staff were in the path when we were bringing the patient from the ICU to the hyperbaric unit. Uh, and then we took them right from the ICU bed, put them right in the chamber and put them in and uh, treated them with hyperbaric. And that work, that has worked and it still works to this day fabulously well. It really works well. And we have not a single uh, staff member has converted positive for COVID-19. So, uh, and despite, uh, and in Opelousas, uh, they've treated, I think, uh, now 28 patients in total. And, and I will tell you, in their experience, zero patients required intubation. Uh, and uh, not a single staff member has, has turned positive for COVID-19 as a result of uh, these treatment. And that's really, uh, and I have to give Marcus all the credit here. Uh, it really is, uh, is his uh, ingenious way of, uh, uh, of uh, protecting uh, the patients, uh, protecting the staff, protecting the patients as, as they move through the hospital. So based on this, we decided to uh, open up uh, uh, the, the offer to treat patients at a variety of hospitals uh, throughout the United States. And uh, we applied for uh, ethics committee, uh, committee approval and were given approval to collect data and uh, obtain consents from the patients that were treated. Um, we have a, a, a wound care research fellow, Dr. Al Jalati, uh, he's one of our doctors from uh, Jordan, uh, who is uh, with us uh, for two years, and uh, uh, he's really taken charge of the the registry and has been collecting data for from uh, all through uh, the United States. Um, what what we what we did at this point was uh, uh, after get, obtaining approval, uh, we gave each of the centers or hospitals that wanted to participate. Uh, an, an informed consent form. They would get local approval from their ethics committee and then um, we treat the patients. Uh, the dive profile, or in other words, the treatment profile that we use in the chamber, that's the dose of the oxygen. It, again, 2.0 atmospheres uh, for 90 minutes and that's been consistent uh, in all the hospitals that have uh, uh, treated patients with uh, severe COVID-19 to prevent mechanical uh, ventilation. And that's our standard protocol. Our data collection act app was developed by a company called Tissue Analytics, and I really have to give them a, a thank you as well uh, in this presentation. Now, Tissue Analytics and our group, the Serena Group Research Foundation, uh, we've been conducting virtual clinical trials all over the world uh, now uh, for a couple of years. And um, in the late uh, 2019, before the pandemic, we had really launched a virtual clinical trial program in which uh, uh, the uh, the we do research without actually going uh, to the research centers. It's all done electronically. And that's not the topic of this presentation, although I will tell you, it really is a, a great way to do clinical trials. Uh, right now, I will tell you that we have a diabetic uh, foot ulcer clinical trial running right now and a pressure ulcer clinical trial. And these are being run virtually. We're not going to the sites and doing it. The sites are collecting it through a simple application, and the application is uh, on the uh, on your cell phone. Uh, so the, the it's an app. It's loaded on the cell phone. Uh, they you can take pictures of wounds and send them in. In this case, we, there was no pictures of wounds. Uh, we were just having the the hyperbaric technicians in the centers 
would uh, uh, collect a series of, uh, uh, of demographic uh, information on the patient. Uh, and then that was sent in to Dr. Al Jalati, and he's been correlating that. In fact, this morning, we just got the first uh, 24 patients um, uh, from the uh, tissue analytics app. Uh, from, we got the data from them, and uh, our group is now beginning to analyze uh, what we hope is 100 patients, and we'll be publishing that uh, probably in the early part of 2021. Uh, uh, and I think the interesting thing here is uh, COVID-19 uh, maybe with us for, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, another six to eight months, uh, depending. Uh, but I think it also, uh, from a scientific and academic standpoint, is very interesting uh, the way that hyperbaric oxygen decreases inflammation. And it's something that we've known experimentally for a long time. Uh, we, we, we know that it decreases pulmonary inflammation in wound care. We know that uh, wounds are highly inflammatory and that uh, the addition of high-dose oxygen, it has a, a distinct anti-inflammatory effect. And this was just a nice demonstration of it. And uh, we were able to uh, 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 prevent mechanical ventilation in a large number of patients. Not 100%, which it was 100%, but it wasn't. All right, so uh, uh, the uh, update from the current registry is... Uh, well, as I said, we have uh, collated and data locked 24 of the patients treated. We have another, um, uh, at least another 24 to 28 patients uh, uh, where uh, Dr. Al Jalati is working on the data. Uh, we we uh, have had 100 patients registered uh, to uh, participate. Uh, however, uh, I'm not sure we'll get all 100, uh, the data from all 100. Uh, we should at least have uh, a little over 50. Uh, and to date, as I said, we, we know of one patient that's required mechanical ventilation out of the entire group so far. Uh, you may have questions about uh, the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for COVID-19. I think it's really fascinating, and uh, we certainly have uh, enjoyed doing it. And uh, it, there's nothing better than seeing someone coming into the, to the uh, uh, hyperbaric unit breathing uh, just continuously at 50 breaths a minute, and then they leave the hyperbaric unit that that same uh, that same day, uh, you know, with a breath countdown, 20 or uh, uh, 15 to 20 breaths per minute. It really is very rewarding. Uh, and I also, as I mentioned earlier, from an academic standpoint, it's incredibly interesting uh, that uh, we were able to decrease pulmonary inflammation uh, in such a manner, and uh, it's uh, it's well worth additional study. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, is part of our research uh, that we do, although it's uh, probably not the main part of our research. Our main research really uh, fits in with this conference very nicely, and that's wound healing. And we have a number, we have actually about eight or nine clinical trials uh, that we run uh, every year on pressure ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, venous leg ulcers, and on diagnostics. Uh, and uh, all those are a, a lot of fun. And if you're into wound care research like I am, I'm sure that uh, you're in, in, yeah, enjoying it. So we have, uh, I mentioned this already, our follow-up publications. Uh, we, we, uh, Marcus and I are, are, are working on a paper now on uh, the safe transport of patients uh, uh, to the hyperbaric unit and how to clean the chamber room and equipment to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, the uh, folks that are looking at cost effectiveness uh, you know, it's it's a lot less expensive to treat a patient with a few hyperbaric treatments than put them on a ventilator. And uh, I don't think anybody doubts that uh, we're going to see uh, a marked uh, a save cost savings. And uh, what we're doing now is we're working with the, the chief executive officer of the Opelousas General Hospital and uh, looking at uh, what it would have cost had to be intubated those patients and placed them on a ventilator as opposed to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And I can tell you in U.S. dollars, it's thousands. Thousands of U.S. dollars were saved uh, with the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, and then finally, uh, the analysis of the registry. Hopefully, uh, we'll have it out by uh, uh, the early part of 2021. And as I said, Dr. Al Jalati is now uh, diligently working through the data uh, and he's just a fabulous fellow, and I'm sure it's going to be a, a really great uh, uh, publication. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end my presentation and uh, turn it back uh, over to you. And uh, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, uh, to join this um, 
uh, to join this conference. Uh, it sounds like an incredibly interesting conference. And uh, I don't know if we take questions now or later, uh, but uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for your terrific presentation, Doctor. Um, definitely this information will be so lucrative for all of the audiences, uh, especially in this circumstance that the world needs new medical therapies. Um, may I ask a question from you? Uh, what is the mechanism behind it? I mean, uh, does uh, hyperbaric oxygen reduce reactive oxygen species or not? Well, we, we actually, it's interesting because uh, hyperbaric oxygen actually increases reactive oxygen species. Uh, uh, um, uh, but, and we think that's part of the virucidal action of it. Now, in diabetic foot ulcers, that's a good thing because it's in diabetics, it stimulates a hypoxic inducible factor, which... Uh, uh, Dr. Which, sorry, uh, sorry, Doctor. Okay. Could you please turn off your share screen? To have oh, image. turn it off? Okay. All right, let me turn it off. Thank you. All right. How's that? It's okay. Thank you. All right, there we go. Thank you. Sorry. All right. So um, I think the way it works is uh, that it decreases pulmonary inflammation. And if I had to guess, I would say uh, that uh, particularly decreasing interleukin-6 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines are uh, how it works in COVID-19. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question, what is the most serious and important side effects of using hyperbaric uh, oxygen in treatment of uh, wounds for wound management, I mean? So the biggest problem that we have is ear bear trauma. So, uh, in, uh, because, because pressure, like flying in a plane, uh, we, you, 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 can have, uh, you can have some ear pain uh, related to it. And that's the number one complication. There are some rare complications such as uh, seizures uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, hypoglycemia, but they're really uncommon. Thank you so much again for your nice presentation. I wish the best for you and be safe and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.